So today I'm talking about this very general title, regular theory for nonlinear PDEs. But if you allow me, I'll try to, to clarify what are the topics I, I intend to cover. So I'll talk about diffusion processes that are allowed to, to degenerate or blow up. So somehow electricity is allowed to collapse. And what happens is that they degenerate or blow up and we allow the equations to have this two problems somehow simultaneously. Right, of course, in different regions of, of the domain, but in some regions, the PDE can degenerate. In other regions, the PDE can blow up. Right? And I'm interested in two, in two classes of problems. This would be the variational setting and the non-variational setting. By variational setting, I mean the P Laplacian, something related to the, to the P Laplacian. In a non-variational setting, I mean fully nonlinear equations. <coughs> right, so I'll try to, I'll try to, to talk about these two, these two distinct settings, these two distinct cases, and then the class of results I'm interested actually regard regularity in Hilbert spaces. So we are trying to say, well, solutions are Hilbert continuous. The gradient of the solutions are Hilbert continuous. Which conditions or the minimal conditions we can impose on the structures of the problem? To, to achieve this kind of this kind of thing, and the the methods we are we are using are very much related to approximation methods, in the sense that we have a PDE, and we don't know things interesting things interesting for us about this about this PDE, but there are other PDEs we are familiar with, and there is established theory. So if we approximate these structures in our problem to these structures governing. Those other PDs, maybe we can, if we are lucky enough, we can import information and bring back information from non from non PDs, non results, back to our to our problems, right? So let me start with this variational setting. So the equation I'm interested in is this kind of theta of x Laplacian or Poisson equation, right? And for me here, the source term is bounded in L infinity. I have the right hand side is always bounded throughout this talk. And here the variable exponent satisfies two, two sets of conditions. There is one set of conditions that will be the same throughout throughout the talk. There's the following. The variable exponent is bounded from above and from below and is bounded from below away from one. Right? So here in the variation of setting we'll try to do two distinct things. So first, we'll ask what can we do if the variable exponent is m merely a, measuring, a measurable bounded function, right? I will have no continuity, no regularity assumptions whatsoever on the variable exponent at first. Then, we'll try to, we'll try to do something more, and to do something more, we must pay a price, and the price will be the regularity, Hilbert continuity of the exponent. Right? So this is more or less the setting in which I'll try to I'll try to work, and this is the things I will rely on to to produce a number of results and, and share them with you. Okay, so let me proceed with some some motivation why to use or why to resort to a pillar partial equation with a variable exponent. So the first, the first application, the first motivation I, I'd like to show you <coughs> regards this problem, this is called the thermistor problem. So the idea is that you have a, a solid and somehow you affect the solid by uh, electric current and you produce heat. Right? So you're trying to study the heat production of a solid by an electric field and electric current. And the model, one of the models governing this, this problem goes like this. So we have here kind of a P of X Poisson equation, and the U is the, is the electric potential. And on the other hand, you have the temperature, there is this theta, and it satisfies a Poisson equation with the right-hand side depending on the, the potential, right? Here, the power, sigma, depends on temperature and the same here. So F is a source term, sigma and lambda are quantities related to conductivity and, and resistance. Right? This exact model was proposed by Zhikov in 2007 and there is a, there is a number of interesting things that people somehow can, can tell about this, about this coupling. 
A second, a second instance where this kind of variable exponents appear is in the realm of electro-rheological fluid. So electro-rheological fluid is a material whose mechanical properties are affected by an electric field. Right? So you have, you have a material, you have a fluid, and once it is affected by, by an electric... <laughs> well, material is affected by, by several, several things. But the, once the material is affected by, by, by a, a current or by a, an electric field, then its mechanical properties change. Right? And in this context, the variable exponents will appear through constitutive relations of the, of the fluid. And there's a very neatly written monography by Kuchiska in 2000. It's a volume in the lecture notes and dealing with, the, with this, this class of problem. Right? There is a third application that I find, that I find very nice there is, that somehow regards image processing and image reconstruction. So suppose you're given an image, an observed image I, and this image is a true image U plus an error. And the observable image is a true image plus an error, right? And you try to, you try to process and to, and to reconstruct this object and then you come, you stumble upon this kind of functional. So you have here this, you have the error here, and here you have the gradient of u, and you try to minimize somehow this quantity. Okay? When you try to minimize this quantity, well, there are some choices you can make about theta. Okay? The first choice you can make about theta is theta equals 1, constant and equals 1. Well, if this is the case, this is a method called ROF, rough, after Rudin, Nosher, and Fatemi introduced somehow the method, then what happens here is that the method is pretty efficient in preserving edges. If you have edges in the image, the method is pretty efficient in preserving edges. However, it produces, allows something called staircasing effect. The staircasing effect is when, when you have a flat region in the image and it's bounded by a surface, but this phenomenon is not present in the true, in the true image. Right. And, well, what if we try to improve this thing? Well, before improving, we can try to change theta. If theta was identically equal to 1, why not to be identically equal to 2? Right. Well, if we set theta identically equal to 2, then what happens is that, okay, this will prevent the staircase in effect, but then you fall short in preserving edges. So what happens as well, the natural thing here, and I'll show you a third option that I assure you is not setting theta identically equal to three, but instead would be consider a variable version of the exponent, right? So you're trying to adjust the exponent locally, trying to incorporate the strengths of both methods and trying at the same time to avoid the, the drawback they present. So in this kind of in this kind of problem, this is very interesting kind of application. I mean you have an image, you have to reconstruct the image. The the, the minimization of these functionals is is I mean profit substantially from a formulation where the exponent is allowed to provide. Right? Okay, so this these are motivations in the in the realm of applications. It's clear that in the in the realm of analytical development we have we have a number of interesting developments, a number of interesting achievements. So I'll we'll start talking about estimates in, in, in the bad spaces. And the first result that appeared is due to a Cherby and Mingioni. And what happens is that weak solutions to this problem here are investigated under the assumption that the exponent theta is log Helder continuous. Log Helder continuous means there is a modulus of continuity whose lim soup times the log of one over, over the radius is, is zero. So if the if the exponents log Helder continues, then what we have is that if this vector field F is Q integrable when you take the norm and raise to this power, then the gradient of the solution, norm also raised to this power, will be again in LQ. The results are local. But what, what, what's, what's being said is, well, 
I have a source term, I have a right hand side that I can write like this and I make an integrability assumption on this quantity then I recover similar information about the gradient of the, of the solutions. There is another, another result more or less simultaneous around the same years due to fun and what fun does is, is this. Well, I have here a source term and I have an exponent, variable exponent, that happens to be Helder continuous. Well, if this is the case, the gradient of the solutions will be also Helder continuous, and the exponent need not to be the same. There will be some, some transmission of this, of this alpha to, to beta somehow, but, and, and, and therefore they, they, are not, they are not the same, they are not expected to be the same. But under the, 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 the assumption that the exponent is Hilder continuous, what I have is a solution whose gradient is Hilder continuous. Actually, in this proof, in this, in this theorem, in this paper, there are, there are more things than actually global regularity and a more general source terms or more general formulations for the thing here you're taking, for the, 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 the vector field you're taking, the divergence. But I think this is it's fair to say this would be a nice workhorse for, for the theory. What's the dependence of theta on the value so on theta? It's not, it's not clear in the argument. Right? You, know, you know it depends through, through some standard regular results, but the, the pass-through mechanism is not explicit, actually. So this is completely different from, uh, from the estimate. I mean, you have the estimate where frame Q is equal to zero, right? Yes, yeah. in this case. The gradient of u is equal to zero. Well, yeah, that, that, that's where you have to estimate. <coughs> that's, I mean, you were not mentioning it, but there is this uh, old paper by Karl Ullenberg, and the method is completely yes. different. Yes, I think. I think yes. So there's, I think no, yes. there's no uh, no super solution argument there of that. Kind? Not that I not that okay. I came across during during reading this thing, actually. Okay, so it's uh, of course this this equation has a, a a very immediate counterpart in minimization of functionals, and what can we say about this about the minimization of, about the minimizers of the related functionals? Right. So in 2001, again, Acerbi and Mingioni studied a class of functionals for which this would be an important point model, and the results that are proven here that are detained here are the following. If the exponent is log Hilder continuous, then W11 minimizers are local, are locally Hilder continuous. So if we work under the assumption that the exponent is log Hilder continuous, then what we can obtain is the Hilder continuity of the minimizers, right? of W11 minimizers. If we increase the regularity of this exponent, from log Hilder continuous to Hilder continuous, then what we prove is that the gradient of the minimizers is actually is actually Hilder continuous. So you jump from C alpha to C1 alpha right, in this in this case. The the last result, this last thing, this last conclusion, is also available in the case of the d-dimensional set in the case of systems. Right? This is for you in R, U of X in R, and this is for U from Rm to, to Rm or Rd. Okay. okay, so in front of this, in face of this previous developments, in face of this motivation, there is a, a, a variety of questions that we can pose, but we confine ourselves to two questions, right? The first one is, what if the exponent is merely continuous? What can I say about the solutions of the equations, if they exist, when the exponents really continues? Right? And the second question is this, well, if I have a Hilder continuous exponent, then I can expect to have C1 alpha for the solutions. Is there any way I can access this problem? Is there any, any path I can touch this problem that would reveal, would unveil, further regularity for, for the solutions, right? And one thing that is interesting to, to keep in mind is this, in the case of a constant exponent, is this thing called C 
here theta prime regularity conjecture, but would be CP prime regularity conjecture, at least as called by some, by some authors, that says the following. If you have the P Laplacian or the theta Laplacian equals to a source term that is bounded, then solutions would be of class C1, 1 over 1 plus alpha. And in fact, this result was, was the conjecture was set in the positive for the, the two-dimensional, in the two-dimensional case by Daniel Araújo, Eduardo Teixeira, and José Miguel Urbano in 2017. You have a theta bounded always in this? No, here theta is fixed. Oh. Here is, is fixed. Is fixed. So what I'm saying, what, what, what I'm, I'm referring to this to say, well, the C1 alpha and with alpha intrinsically bounded is, is a property that we should expect, right? And the thing is, is there any additional, that, uh, additional constraint that would sound natural that under such a constraint we could improve the regular solutions? So this is the second question I'm, I would be interested, right? So the first one can be answered by this, this result. I call it a warm-up result. I'll try, to, I'll try to, to explain why. That we obtained together with these two, two graduate students, Gianni Rampasso and, and Maxon Santos. Maxon is now in, in Florida visiting Eduardo Teixeira for a period of one year, enjoying a lot. And Gianni has her defense is scheduled to the next week. Unfortunately, I'll be here. But the thing is, the thing is, uh, the theorem reads as follows. Suppose we have a, a exponent, an exponent that is bounded and a bounded source term, right? So what happens is that there exists a unique solution to this problem, say the Px Poisson equation, in W1 theta dot, let's say, and if we have the additional condition that the lower bound for the exponents is strictly above the dimension, then solutions are held continued. Right? So what I'm saying is, if I have no assumption whatsoever on the, on the exponent, but boundedness and measurability, I can infer the existence of solutions, and under a perhaps too far-fetched additional assumption that the thing is above, the lower bound is above the dimension, then I can recover an inclusion in, in, in Hilder spaces. Okay. Why do I call it a, a warm-up result? Because, well, the strategy to prove something like this would be to, to look at this functional here and try to minimize it. And once a, a theory of Lebesgue and Sobolev spaces with variable exponents is established, then this is more or less off the shelf. Right? There is this monography from 2011, it's again a lecture notes, a spring lecture notes by Dinning, Angeleto, Ashto, and Huchika, where they, they in fact compile several, several developments in the theory of Lebesgue and Sobolev spaces with variable exponents. It's a very nice book. And by using, by combining things there, you can you can prove something like this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I just have a question. So there is something happening with these spaces when the theta is not low and uh, continues, right? I don't remember exactly what. Is it something about the compact and the? the I mean, there is something related to the density of the oh, smooth the C, the smooth yeah. functions. Yes. Okay, but this does but if, if you were if you're in the case where the lower bounds are strictly above the dimension, then you satisfy this thing. Oh, okay. Then you satisfy this thing. It's one of the conditions. Mm -hmm. And then, and what you use is that w one theta minus it relates to w one theta in such a way that you can embed w one theta minus in C alpha. So this is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. If you have this this lower bound above dimension, the Hilbert continuity follows. So this this is actually this is truly a warm up a warm up thing, it's just to get acquainted with the, the structures we're dealing with the, and the, the the things we are we're trying to to touch. Okay, but then there was this the second question. Right, the second question is slightly more involving, and the answer. The answer is, is here again with Gianni and, and Maxon. 
And what we do is this. We assume we have, again, an exponent that is bounded. We are here in the homogeneous setting. But now, the exponent is not only bounded, it's Hilder continuous. What can I say if the exponent is Hilder continuous? We know from, the, from previous developments in the literature that solutions would be C1 alpha. Right? So let me look for an additional condition on, on theta. Let me say, and why not, that theta is close to, today my favorite number is 2, in L infinity. Right? If theta is close to 2 in L infinity, and I'm not saying it's above 2, I'm not saying it's below 2, I'm saying it's close, right? Can I say it? If it's close to 2, my hope is that I can import regularity from the Laplacian, right? from the case where theta is in fact 2. And it actually happens, and what we can prove is that the gradient of the solutions is asymptotically Lipschitz, which means that the gradient is in C alpha for every alpha between 0 and 1, excluding, excluding 1. Okay? So what happens is, if we, if, if we assume the exponent to be close somehow to 2, we can import further regularity from the Laplacian equation, from the, the, the Poisson equation, and then improve the regularity we have for the solutions here. So that closeness doesn't affect the alpha? The alpha affects the, 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 the closeness, actually. Because what happens is we have to make universal choices along the process. And once you say, well, I want solutions to be of C1 alpha star. Okay, then you get and angry. then you come back in some sort of reverse engineering trying to, to solve this smallness is, is the smallness of this L infinity norm of this difference has to do with the with the, the regularity. So how do we how do we prove this thing? So our goal will be to control the oscillation of the of the solutions in balls of small radius. We, we, want, we want to look and the oscillation of the solutions in some, in some balls. What, what, what happens is that the solutions to the theta x Laplacian equation are, are not really scaling friendly. Right? They, they don't want to scale if you, if, you, if you change solution. So if you have a solution and you multiply it by a positive constant, let's say gamma, then gamma times the solution fails in being a, a, a solution to the equation. Right? So you don't want the equation, uh, the equation is on to, to scale, and you need the equation to, to scale. So you have to negotiate somehow with the PDE and come up with a compromising solution. Right? And the compromising solution is this thing called C1 small corrector. The C1 small corrector is something whose regularity is known and is small as the name says, and corrects the fact that the equation is not scale-friendly. Right? So once we do that, we combine the existence of small correctors with an oscillation control that is gradient-dependent somehow. I'll try to, I'll try to, to show you how it, how it works. Basically, in the regions where the gradient is above the radius, then, then what happens is that we resort to standard regular theory. In the regions where the gradient is small, then we have to, to use this, this gradient-dependent oscillation control. So this is more or less the picture. So if you give a radius that is below the gradient, then of course the gradient is above the radius, and in this region I have elliptic theory. Right? If, on the other hand, the gradient is below the radius, then I have to do something else. Okay. And I'll try to, to show you what this something else is. So let me start by, by telling you about the existence of the small corrector. So we have the homogeneous equation, we have our assumption on, on theta, Hilder continuity, and then given delta, I can find an epsilon, strictly positive, such that if this difference in L infinity is epsilon small, then I can come up with a function that is C1 in a slightly smaller ball, and I can control the norm of the function and the norm of its gradient by delta in the same ball. Right? This, would be, this would be enough 
of course, it's not enough for, for, for the theorem, but for me, this would be very nice. The thing that I find most attractive in this kind of arguments is the fact that the solution plus this small character is an harmonic function. By being an harmonic function, I'm sure this is C11. Right? It's more. Should be more. But, but, but this is C11, and C11 does the job. Right? Okay, so once I prove something like this, I can tackle the, the scaling, the scaling problem, and then what I want to do is to control the oscillation along the critical set. So again, I impose this smallness regime, and then what I say is that, well, I can control this difference in balls of radius r by this quantity, it, it looks promising, times 1 plus this thing here. If the gradient at zero is below r raised to alpha, then this inequality does the job and, and we're in business, right? So as a corollary, if I can control the gradient at zero by this, then this supremum, of course this capital C and this capital C differ, but, but the thing is, the thing is, we would we would continue the argument with we would go, right? So this is this is the structure we 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 resolve to to prove the improved regularity in the variational setting, and now I'll try to to approach the non-variational setting. So what happens in the non-variational setting is that, on the contrary of what we did before, we are considering here the theta of x Laplacian, but written in a, in a slightly in a slightly different way. So the equation we have is something like this. So we have a fully nonlinear, uniformly elliptic operator f. We have a source term small f in L infinity, and the whole thing here in the in the left hand side is pre-multiplied by the norm of the gradient raised to this power. Right? And what we assume is that these inequalities are mutually satisfied for symmetric matrices M and N with N a non-negative matrix. This is the, the uniform ellipticity, lambda capital of the uniform ellipticity. And we assume the source term to be bounded, to be a bounded function. I mean, it's not essentially bounded, it's bounded. It has to be bounded, right? And here the variable exponent is merely bounded and measurable. Here, I don't want to use Hilda regularity of the exponent. In this case, I don't even want to use Hilda continuity. Right? I want to allow this guy here to be discontinuous. I might be interested in studying this problem in the presence of jumps here. Right? In some settings, these jumps might might even depend on the on the solution, so I don't want to, to impose to impose continuity. Okay, so in the case of constant exponents, this problem was studied by by Damien Araujo, Gleison Ricard, Eduard Teixeira, was studied also by Isabel Benindel and François de Miguel, and Cyril Imbert and, and Louis Silvestri. And a number of developments are available. So there is local and global regularity of the solutions. Compare some principles for, for discussing solutions and the study of, of a generalized notion of eigenvalues as well. Right. And one thing that is interesting for us is that if theta is fixed, then the optimal regularity of the solutions is given by the minimum between the cleavage of fun of regularity for, uh, for the homogeneous PDE governed by F and this quantity here. Right. So here we have precisely the exponent that is conjectured to hold true in the in the CP prime conjecture for the P Laplacian equation. Okay, so what's the theorem we proved here? This result was, was obtained with my colleague Annie Bronzi, Gianni, and, and Eduardo Teixeira. What we prove is this: if we have this PD, F is bounded this thing is merely bounded and measurable, then a viscosity solution to this equation is C1 alpha lock, and alpha is the minimum between the Krilov Safan of theory, the Krilov Safan of regularity, and 1 over 1 
plus the contribution coming from the, the generate process and the contribution coming from the singular process. I, I'm using contribution here for actually this, this terms jeopardize the, the, the real letter. Actually, the thing is, if you have a process that's only singular, then, or I, uh, either only singular or only the generate, you recover the optimal regularity of the, of the constant exponent setting. Otherwise, you have both contributions here to, to take care of. Right. And there is a universal constant here that produces an appropriate estimate, an appropriate in the sense that it depends on the L infinity norm of the solutions and the L infinity norm of the source term raised to a power that comes actually from the, from the scaling of the equation. Because in the case theta equals to minus one, that's the case when we have the yeah, homogeneities of the same homogeneity, so they cancel each other. Actually, we this case is completely outside of the of the of the scope of the result due to a very sad technicality. I'm thinking that at some point if you, we, it, if you scale it, it's invariant when theta is is minus one. Yes, yes. It's invariant, and you cannot, uh, so the scaling will not help you. Mm, yeah, in this case. Is that, is that the reason, or is there? Actually, actually, this, this would be a much more interesting reason, but the reason actually comes from an application of Jensen's lemma. We need some preliminary level of compactness, we resort to Jensen's lemma, and there is a constraint on theta, on the, on the infimum of theta, mm -hmm. that appears I mean, through the, the technicality. Through complexity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, but this would be a much more, much more involved reason, actually. Okay, so the thing, the thing for us, the thing for us is to somehow characterize the regularity in terms of the, the, the contributions coming from the degenerate and the contributions coming from the singular part of the, of the, of the domain. And produce an estimate of this of the sort. How do we how do we prove something like this? Before we proving something like this, let me tell you that something like this, an exponent that is half the, the sign of the of the models of x to minus one is within the scope of the of the of the theorem actually a continuous approximation or at least a bounded approximation of something like this, right? So the idea is that the method can bring together the elliptic, the generate and the elliptic singular settings together and you don't really see the region switching, neither in the in the in the method or or in the or in the estimate, right? Okay. So as I as I as I mentioned before, the, the result tries to capture the impact of both both regimes of, of collapsing ellipticity. And the way we prove this thing is trying to import from this homogeneous equation governed by, by F, C1 alpha regularity. Right. So the thing is, by Krilov Safanov theory, we know that under the assumption of uniform ellipticity, solutions, viscosity solutions to this problem are C1 alpha. And there is a natural question. The natural question is, well, if f is convex, you could try to import more than C1 alpha, right? The Nevin's Kilo theory would be available, and you would be able to import C2 alpha. Right. The thing is that even if you have Laplacian, the optimal regularity in the constant setting is C1, 1 over 1 plus theta. Right. So even if you have a complex operator, in the case of the Laplacian, you don't get more than C1, 1 over 1 plus, plus theta. So importing C2 alpha here for us wouldn't be, wouldn't be of any help, actually. And therefore, therefore we confine to the, to the clear of the theory. So when you say optimal regularity in the case of the Laplace one, you mean not with zero right hand side, I guess. No, bound, no, 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 yeah, no, no. Yeah, if we if we don't have the F, if we're in the homogeneous setting, then you can prove that the solutions. Yeah. 
you, you, you can rigorously prove that you get rid of the gradient, yeah. and then whatever yeah, whatever happens, you you count on. But the thing here is is well, the thing is that you're, you're, you're importing back to your original problem the regularity of this this guy here, and then you say, well, why are you important C1 alpha if in some cases inter C and in important cases would have more, right? But this is this is the natural thing that we that we stumble upon. So the first step will be to prove some preliminary level of compactness of the solutions and at this point we resort to Jensen's lemma to prove some sort of C beta regularity for, for the solutions. And this will be this will be instrumental in the in the in our argument. The second thing is an approximation lemma, in the sense that given an epsilon, you have a smallest regime under which structures are, are closed. And finally, an iterative argument. And well, the first thing will be what well, I did not understand, but you are saying you are dealing with all sorts of all odds with both uh, at the same time, but I mean uh, how do you use that? I mean, after all, f d two q will be a function which either is close to zero or is close to infinity, right? And you don't know, and then you are, you are in both, both things are, are dealt with at the same time, per se? Yes. I, I don't see that. I mean, oh yes. What, what, I, mean, what I mean? Yeah, what I mean? What I mean is this: the argument we are using, the argument we are using, relies on the fact that we have the three ingredients available, and the three ingredients will not separate cases between the generate and singular to 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 produce what we need. So, in fact, under the under the singular case or the degenerate case, the arguments run through, right? And the result we get by incorporating both the, the, the contributions at the same time, somehow says, well, if you have something that oscillates a lot or something that is constant, we are recovering the same thing. So this is, this is what I'm trying to, to, to say. So what's the lower bound on tick down? It's mm, minus one. Okay. It's minus one. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the compactness of the solutions comes from the, the Jensen's lemma. And we prove the compactness for something that is pre-multiplied by something by, by, by a quantity like this. There is a Q here that will be arbitrary, but we manage to prove Hilder continuity of U. And an universal estimate, and this universal estimate also plays a role in the in the subsequent argument. Right? And what's important for us will be an approximation lemma that reads like this: If we have a delta, we can find an epsilon such that if this smallness regime is satisfied, then I can find a function that is in some C1 alpha. And there is actually a delta close to the solution in L infinity. Right? Because what, what happens in here is that I want to find a fine functions that approximate the solution, and I want to start with some sort of ansatz. And the ansatz will be age at zero plus the gradient of age at zero product with x. Right? So this will be this will be the first the first step in an iterative argument. So the approximation lemma yields the function that will somehow be the main actor in this in this in this argument. Right? And then what we have to do is to come up with a sequence of a fine function z n plus b n times x, satisfying these three these three conditions here. Right? And here for us n is in the natural numbers and gamma is the minimum between these two quantities. The way to do it is to, to use an induction argument. So the first step in the induction argument is to assume that A0 is 0, B0 is 0, but then H help us out in finding A1 and B1. Right. So, okay. 
And then what happens is A1 is H at 0 and B1 is DH at 0. So this thing will account for the first step in the induction argument. We assume the, the thing has been established for N equals K. And once we assume it has been established for N equals K, the job is to tackle the case K plus 1. And to do it, we have to scale. Right? So we scale the solution. We come up with a VK that is U evaluated along rho raised to K times X minus the K affine function that we know from the, from the induction hypothesis to, to exist and then normalized by the, by the radius raised to some appropriate, appropriate power. So once we do this, then we conclude that VK is entitled to the same approximation lemma. There is an H bar associated with VK and such a V bar will conclude, will, uh, H bar will allow us to conclude the, the induction argument. Once the induction argument is available, what we have is the oscillation control at discrete scales of the order ray, uh, rho raised to, to n. Right? And then to conclude the thing, we have to do a type of argument that comes from the discrete to the continuous thing, and then, then the whole thing would be, would be established. This type of argument here, I like to think about it as if you have a movie, Right. And if you have the role of the, mu the movie, you have a number of pictures, and the pictures are the discrete scale, but once it gets high speed, what you recover is, the, is actually the movie. So this is, a, this is how the thing would be. I understand that this would work in the case where you, have, where you are degenerate, where you are going to the gradient equal to zero, but I, mean, I don't understand how does this work when the gradient is going to infinity? Or are you actually in a situation where in the end you get power on the gradient? So the bi's converge to infinity, in other words. It will converge to the gradient of u at zero. Well, I mean, the proof, proof, the proof proof singularity happens. would mean that you, are, that you have to look at a situation. Is that ever possible? Do you ever get a situation where in this iterative argument, you start from an average gradient and then you end up at infinity, or are you always ending up at a... No, if, I, if I am in the singular case, and the yeah, and that's, that's what's happening, then the Bs have, have to go this way. Yeah. That's, that's, the only, that's the only manner to, and, and to assure it's How does this go in here? I mean, what, what happens to the raw case? Uh, Ah, well, I, I, I would I approximate with this, like a harmonic function, and then and that at the smaller, smaller scale, that would approximate the gradient for that function. Yes. So it has nothing to do with infinity or nothing. Oh, it? sure, it has something to do with infinity. I mean, if it's going to infinity, it's not okay. It has, has to scale completely different in this argument, right? It's not. It has to, because after all, if it doesn't scale yeah, like scale. infinity, you would, you would get you would get the Lipschitz constant, right? So the whole K has to has to scale differently. Where do I, do I see this? I don't. I don't. I haven't stumbled upon this kind of this kind of speed bump in the in the proof in the arguments, and I understand why you're why you're pointing out. But, but I'd like to see the example how this works. When, when yeah, when, you, when see, you, you see, the, the impression I have, anything? the impression I have is that when you approximate, because you see this function h doesn't approximate the solution in any respect with the gradient. So the approximation is in an infinity. Right. And I am not sure if this kind of thing will somehow blind the argument to what happens in infinity and constrain the, the argument makes things work. I don't know if there is a spillover of this of this regularity preventing this kind of this kind of problem. This would be my guess, but it's nothing more than a guess. So I, I, I would be more than than happy to go through this these things and privately discuss this kind of potential pathology. Right? So okay, of course, of course, this is this is a class. This is a, a corpus of results that that I found 
I found personally very, very rewarding to, to produce, but I think there is a connection to, to, to boxes we could open in, the, in, the, in, further, in further works. And so what was the function H you mentioned in the beginning? This function is the approximating uh, okay. function from here. Okay. 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 Yes. So what you do is you, you approximate by something that is regular, and then this exponent somehow bounds what you have. Will will bound what you have. So you can you, you make universal choices in order that everything works. So this guy being here, there's a Taylor expansion that, that helps us out, and that's the, that's the drill. Yeah, yeah, but then exactly at this point, of course, when you go to the original Uhlenbeck proof, I mean, there you really make a, make a distinction, right? Either you stay away from, uh, from zero in that case. That's very nice to know. And the other thing that's is, of nice course, enough. is uh, that uh, you don't stay away from zero, right? So that you have a certain decay of the cubes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I don't know. That's why I was asking okay. how it works in the other case. Well, now we'll revisit the yeah. the thing with this in mind, trying to, to capture yeah. this this phenomenon. But mm. Mm. nice, nice. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, if there's no other slide that I don't remember of popping up, I think it was all I had to say. <laughs> 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 And then you have solution of a usual equation with the bounded right hand side. Yes, yes. This would be this would be an interesting thing to do. What we did was to say, well, I don't have an assumption of continuity on theta, but let's assume theta is continuous at x zero. What can I say? And then you have improved the real in the center. Right? So you have some sort of sharp results if you know that at some point the thing is well behaved or well prepared somehow. But, but, but yes, yeah, you're right, you're right. You could try to open this box as well. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Just a little remark, in the variational case, there uh, was kind of uh, the uh, whole development when you, when you were looking at uh, uh, harmonic maps, or p-harmonic maps, rather than, uh, than functions. And uh, the C1 alpha regularity, of course, there was also one about functions, right? So it's only the C0 alpha which is different. But when you did that, uh, I mean, the notion came up, uh, well, borrowed from Arndt of the uh, uh, almost minimizer of certain functions in variation of case. Uh, this was the papers by Hutchins and, and uh, Hamburger in, uh, in, in well, I don't know exactly, uh, something like early 80s. And uh, I'm just wondering, when you compare that, I mean, in the case where you look at your equation, uh, did you have a look in which sense these were almost or quasi minimizers for the constant case locally? No. No, it would be complete. I mean, I, I don't see it at the moment, but I mean, okay. also something to look into. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.